husband's sakes, take advantage of that and extend your own selves out to your neighbors. This winter, we're going to have an extended effort of a training sessions into our trading areas. Now, in that, we are going to come into those communities with staff. We're going to do our doggondas to involve the shipping members of our program, whatever program it would happen to involve, in this case, slaughter cattle. When you walk out of those sessions, you are going to have better than an average grasp of the exact procedure of your marketing program that pertains to you. Now, for heaven's sakes, get rid of this intimidation, get rid of this inadequate feeling, and get down that road and talk to that producer because I can point out a man sitting in this audience right now that can get in his car in the state of Maine, I guarantee you, can come home by Friday night with 20 new memberships, and that's about as many stops as he will have made. You know why? There's no intimidation to that man. There is nothing inferior to his feeling. He walks in with total knowledge that the man in his state was bid 84 on Holstein steers, or 87, excuse me. This guy sold him for a dollar four. He also had cows, and you correct me, Kenton, that the man was bid $78 on, and I'm not talking one or two, I'm talking trailer load. And he ended up getting, and he got the cow sold for a, a dollar and one cents a pound. Now, do you have to feel inferior with that kind of a track record? Sometimes you remind me of Secretariat backing up ass backwards in the starting blocks. <laughs> Turn around and go the direction you have at your capacity to go the best in. That's straightforward and hard. I've said it before and I mean it. It's a hard business and it's a tough business. It's a very serious business. We in the home office and the people like Kenton and Art Wilson and the other staff for the sake of missing someone, we have made that total commitment to you. Now, for heaven's sakes, take advantage of us. Put us to work for you. Any questions you have, talk to Steve. Feel free to call me. Talk to the directors that are in your community. Get the word to us. But we've got to have your involvement. Steve, I'm really proud of you. I appreciate the chance to come in here, and thanks for coming to the convention. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present to you the Vice President of Packerland Packing Company, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, Mr. Gene Stapps. This represents the second opportunity you have given me to attend your convention. I am truly honored to be asked to address your organization. I would like to divide my talks into three areas. One, NFO as we see it from Packerland. Two, you have a stake in the packing industry. Three, the decades of the 80s as we see them. We at Packerland virtually remember your early organization days as you struggled for identity and have tried to obtain recognition and have your voice heard in the marketplace. Those were truly frustrating times. And there were many people who felt that you could not survive, and probably many of them didn't want you to. But you've changed, and you worked some changes, and left an impact. I'd like to address those changes. A, you served to make consumers more mindful of the importance of the role of agriculture 
in food and total economic picture. You've helped make consumers and the public in general aware of the poor return the farmers were getting for their hours of hard work and huge investments in producing food in abundance at low cost to consumers. You successfully call the nation's attention to the economic plight of the small farmer. You tried to deny and repudiate the law of supply and demand and discover that it's working very alive in every country in the world. So you decided to work with it and use it. As a result, today you have put together a sophisticated working collecting bargaining system we have seen anyone put together in the livestock business. Why has your bargaining concept worked? You have put knowledgeable people at the head of your sales staff that you didn't have there before. People who knew livestock grades, yields, values, and markets. You develop integrity. When you say you're going to deliver 500 head at a price, that's what you deliver. You have people representing you who are smart enough to know what the cattle, the packer wants, how he wants them, and when he wants them, and then negotiate for the top dollar for that supply. In total, you've grown up and are providing a very needed useful service for your membership and to the packer. We congratulate you on this. Now let me move in the second part of my message. You have a stake in the pack and house industry. You've heard of the, the, the congressional investigations of meat packing industries, allocation of price fixing, rigging of the yellow sheet of monopolistic practices. Most of these have gone unproven and represents more politicking than realism. Yet, this industry is going through a change and it is affecting you. The beef pack industry is a narrow margin industry with profits normally average one cent on the sale dollar. That little leaves us with little room for errors or mistakes. From 1975 through 1978, Cattlemen lost untold dollars in cow-calf and feeding operations. Herds were liquidated, and when the 79 roll, 1979 rolled around, we entered a new phase of the cattle cycle with marketings reduced by 15 to 18 percent. From January 1 to August 31st, 1979, 263 packing houses and produ producers in the United States shut their doors. Numerous have done since. Although the large packers survived quite well and improved their share in the marketplace, many of the independent packers didn't make it, and those who survived were quite weakened. We were one of the surviving independents, but retrenched from a four-plan operation to a two-plan operation slaughtering and processing about 1,200 head per day. The independent packer is a very vital link in this meat chain. And we, of course, are grateful that you have seen fit to recognize this and actively support the independent packer. By the same token, we do like doing business with you because you control enough supply to make it really worthwhile doing business with you you would not have that similar value to your large packer. Let me make a further comment on the large packer syndrome. It has become quite popular to look for whipping boys to explain our ills. But things are not always as they seem to be. The packer of the 1920s, Armour, Swift, Cudahy, Wilson, have slipped to the position of secondary importance in this beef slaughtering industry. Indeed, they have concentrated and diversified engaging in added values in their products through further processing. They were unseated by a new breed of packer, the IBP, the MPXL, Montford's, and the Spencers. These packers came with in, in with new highly automated plants, 
lower kill costs, lower labor costs, and the skillful merchandising of box beef that has created an unprecedented demand for the beef and changed the industry forever. However, their sheer size and aggressiveness soon led to charges of price manipulations as they moved in and out of the markets. It is true that they exercised tremendous amount of influence Yet your organizations such as NFO and feeders will generally have to make the decision as to how much control you want any one packer to have on the market. Your marketing program support of the independent will determine whether you will indeed have an effective competitive market. We have learned some other hard lessons in the past 36 months. The packer is far more concerned about the producer than the producer is about the packer. That is a mistake. You produced 129 pounds of beef carcass weight for every man, woman, and child in 1975 and went broke doing it. If you'll produce 100 pounds per capita in 1980, you will make some money doing it. Now that ought to be telling you something. Don't overlook the factor called demand and what the housewife is willing to pay for something. We're killing two million hogs a week. That's more hogs than six weeks ago. And yet they are five to six cents a pound higher in, in price because of the tremendous taste that has been generated for pork. And at the same time, there is currently a relatively good demand for beef. Producers and packers need to be viewed as partners for progress than as adversaries. It is in our best interest to do the best marketing job of your products as possible. You have to allow us to be strong enough to do that. That strength is what a guarantee supply is able to achieve. A guaranteed supply, however, does not mean that we or other packers should be whipsawed from week to week with the supply dangling in front of us that we fully can't count on. You're not worth much to us on that basis, and we aren't worth much to you. That brings me to my last point. What can we expect in the 80s? The 10% inflation rate will not abate. That along with $2 a gallon gasoline will put livestock people into a bad cost price freeze. Farm products will have to rise. You will, have, you will see more $75 and $85 cattle, and you will. Cattle numbers are in the rebuilding phase of the cycle, and you will probably be peaking out in 1985. We hope the farmers will not overexpand. Your ideas of selling sows are good supply managers' suggestions to keep supplies within the levels that will allow you to retain profits. Monitor cattle supplies. Keep your membership informed as to where they are in the cycle and encourage them not to overexpand. There are reasons to believe that the world demand of export meat will continue to expand in 1980, and then as they did in the 70s. We urge you to lend your support in that development. As cattle numbers increase, pack and house cap capacities will have to increase to accommodate the new supply. New packer producer arrangements will develop as parties increase their appreciation for each other. You've picked up a lot of marketing expertise in the last several years. You've developed an image of credibility and responsibility. Go with that same plan in the next decade, and you shall make a everlasting contribution to the livestock industry. In conclusion, we at Packerland really believe that our two parties are in this together and are mutually interested in having a strong, profitable livestock industry. Thank you. Would you please welcome from Newport, New York, Anita Maxwell. Got to be a little short this afternoon. I got kind of long-winded this morning. Um, 
we've had many experiences out there. I think the point I want to bring out to you people is if you're discouraged that your county is dead, nothing's going on, you know, we all go through that. We've gone through spots in our state for one reason or another where we've been beaten in the milk industry by the cooperatives and it took a few years for the stuff to hit the fan and the cooperatives now are buckling under terribly with large assessments and uh, all kinds of financial losses, Dairy Eastern milk producers, all these people. Uh, they've reduced the farmers to practically nothing. You know, they'll give them a termination notice, some of the independents will, and say, you've got 30 days to find a new market. And uh, sometimes these farmers, their family had been on the farm for maybe seven generations, and here they were left without a market, and it was only our organization that came in and helped them. I want to impress upon you that there's nothing that farmers working together can't do uh, we had a little incident when we first tried marketing milk in the state of New York, and it took us several months to even get a license to market our own milk. And we had given our handlers termination notices saying we were going to market through NFO. And uh, the state refused to give us a license, and uh, the day come that we were supposed to quit shipping to our independents, and one handler thought he was going to teach us a lesson, and the farmer who was shipping to him only happened to be one of our, there was only 27 of us that started this, first in the Northeast. So they told John, uh, well, you think that NFO is so great, just see what it does with your milk now. And of course, we had no reloads in the whole Northeast at all. And uh, we just didn't know what to do. We had one of our farmers bought a bulk tank truck, and he was ready to uh, pick up milk anytime, so we got our heads together one night and we thought, well, poor John shouldn't suffer for the rest of us. So uh, we called it the midnight ride of Dick Abriza, who was our trucker. He went out every other night about 11, 12 o'clock in the dark, and he picked John's milk up and he brought it around and he distributed it into three or four of our tanks, you know, weighed how, measured how much he put in our tanks. We all came up in milk production that for a week or two, real good, you know, about four or five of us. And uh, after about two weeks went by, the handler came back to John and he said, well, I guess I've taught you a good lesson. Uh, I guess I'll take your milk from now on. And he said, what have you been doing with it? And John says, oh, it's a big crick out back, still isn't even full yet, you know. But it just shows what farmers working together can do. So anyways, we've gone along. We haven't had the participation in the meat program we should. We're working on our dairy now. It's going to be a few months before we get a plant in there that's going to be able to handle it. So Walt was out in our area in June, and he was telling about saturating a county, trying to do, get all your production out of one county. Don't leave any stone unturned. And it kind of kept preying on my mind, and I thought, well, we live in Herkimer County, and we do have a fair membership in the county. But they weren't participating. We have an excellent cull cow program, and they hadn't been participating like they should. So long about 1st of September, when I got a lull in there between the farmers uh, doing their haying and going into uh, silo filling, I started out on the road every few afternoons a week. And we have a large dairy farm, my husband and I. We have 11 children and a large dairy farm. And uh, kids all help us. Some are married. Some are there on the farm. But I started going out every afternoon. I just became obsessed with this. I thought, why aren't these farmers joining? Why aren't they participating, at least in the meat program? And then we did inventory all their milk. We've got the milk ready to go when this plant is open. So I started door to door. And Devon had told us at the last board meeting, I'm the only lady member on the board, by the way, uh, of directors. And uh, he told us at the board meeting the end of July to go out and try to sign up five young farmers under 35. And I really didn't think there were that many in my county. But I went home and I started looking and I found several, several. And uh, we, and being on the FHA committee, it helped me tremendously in getting to these people. Uh, they almost all applied for loans, so I knew where they were. And after we granted them the loans, I, within you know a comfortable length of time, a month or two, I got around to them. And I signed up 100% of the young FHA people under 35. Um, I was batting real good for a while there before the farmers got back in the fields again. I was hitting uh, about 75% of all contacts. And by the way, I found it most successful to sit down with a husband and wife together because quite often the wife was the one that prodded dad into joining. You know, he'd brag how great a milk production he was getting and how 
great his crops were, and she'd say, but we aren't paying our bills, you know that, and she'd be the one that would prod him into doing it. So anyways, this went along, and we kept pushing it and pushing it, uh, urging them to join, and we were having tremendous success. We had to lay off again in October because everybody was back in the fields. Uh, along about second week in November, I decided to send them all a letter because we weren't getting the participation, and my husband was going door to door. After I was signing them, I seemed to have a little better knack at signing them than some of the men did in our area, so I was doing that. He would sometimes go, or our county president would go with me, and then he would go around and prod the older members. We still weren't getting their participation. So I sent them all a letter telling them that we were going to conduct an experiment. Since we had signed up so many in this one county, we were asking all the central New York counties to ship every cull, cow, and calf for just 60 days. Now this wouldn't kill them because we were getting, we were getting six and seven cents over the sheet anyways. We have a beautiful uh, program. So I said, just try for 60 days and see what'll happen. Well, the phone call started coming in, unbelievable. And I got so elated after about a week, we went to the packer and we said, gee, give us a little more incentive. You want more meat, we'll get you more, but do something. And he said, well, we could use more kill on Monday because our butchers aren't very busy. So I'll give you an extra penny on the cows and two cents on the calves. So a week later, Thanksgiving afternoon, my youngsters folded the papers, I wrote a, addressed another 350 letters and told them, you're doing fantastic, the Packer's happy, he's given us an extra premium, get your calls in by Sunday noon. And you know, we ordinarily by Monday morning, if uh, our house, there's several others that pick up in our area, but we pick up one end of Herkimer County, if we got six calls Monday, by Monday morning, we were doing good. Well, the first week we got 19, then we went on to 30, and the last week we got 51 calls and it just started mushrooming. And uh, the thing that we were doing that I would urge all of you to do if you're doing anything like this, is after you wait a week or so, they get their check, go back, my husband goes back and talks to them, is there any problem, do you understand the check, were you satisfied? And we have had all of them satisfied. A few had questions, but it's real good, uh, Steve calls it servicing them, and I guess that's what you have to do. But. Um, the one point I've run out to these farmers as we were signing them was even if you sold all your production to a cattle jockey or an auction or anybody and got the same identical price you're getting through NFO, which they don't, but even if you did, you're giving your production away. You aren't doing anything with it all. By shipping it through the organization, you're building a program not only for yourself, but for the future of your own youngsters. And this is one thing that really concerns me, seeing these young kids uh, that are barely paying interest on their loans who are, have the FHA loans. So anyways, it, it has worked quite well. I haven't got a lot of time. I'm not going to go into much detail because Walt's got to be out of here in a little while. But uh, I just want to tell you, I urge every one of you, especially the women, you know, men cannot refuse a woman. And I have never used any womanly wiles on them at all, I guarantee you. I'm dead serious when I organize. Um, I flatter the old guys once in a while and tell them they're cute or something, but, uh, you know, it's hard for an old grandmother to get very far with the kids under 35, although they seem to, uh, I hear Mankey says, you got to stack a booth with young people. The young people come to me, maybe because I have so many children, many of them have been in school with my kids, play ball at school with our kids. Uh, they look up to me. I, I've helped them in a lot of situations. This is one thing, uh, even though we are a dairy area, there's a lot of other things we can do. We help them in the FHA loan department. We help them with their own handlers when they have a problem. We help them any way we can where they feel there's a need for it and you've got a total organization supporting it. Even in legislation, many of them understand the good work that Chuck Frazier and Ann do in Washington for us. So there's many facets to this, to selling it. So just don't be discouraged because you say our county's dead. Our county's been dead too, lots of times. Our county president didn't even have nerve enough to go out and ask anyone to join the organization when our pay price was real low. But I've never been ashamed of belonging to this organization. I've always been proud. I'm, I've always uh, held my head high and believed in what I was doing. And I think that probably is the thing that uh, impresses farmers the most. You have to have your production going there first. Every pound of your milk and meat or grain or whatever 
has got to be going through the system. You have got to feel the same aches and pains that they're feeling, and then they'll believe what you're doing is the right thing. But there's a difference in attitude. If you haven't been out and asked farmers to join the National Farmers Organization a long time, get out and try it. And don't give up. I've gone back to people who, you know, maybe eight, ten years ago ran our men out with a gun or a pitchfork. And I'm not joking. It actually happened, especially during the time of the milk strike in 67 when there were a lot of hard feelings made in our county. But I've gone back, and these people have joined, and they're bragging. Do you know as soon as they signed their name on the membership agreement, it's all of a sudden it's their organization. What can I do? And then they'll defend it like it was their wife, you know. Most of you do defend your wives, even though you quarrel with her once in a while. But um, it can be done, and I want to urge every one of you, if I could just make somebody in every county do what we have done in Herkimer County, New York, um, this thing would be done right across the United States. And it only took me, you know, I'm an old grandmother with this big farm. I helped them still run the farm. I got all these kids in the house to take care of yet. And the kids help us tremendously. They believe in what we're doing. But I only get out a few afternoons a week. Um, would you believe I announced on the radio one day, I said only NFO members can take part in this experiment we're doing for 60 days. And would you believe two farmers called me and said, um, can I ship meat and not milk? And I said, sure. And how much does it cost to buy? $75 a year, like it always did. I'm the only one that sends Steve in typewritten type membership agreements. I get the information over the phone, type them up. Even in the dairy, I've signed up quite a few over the telephone. And I send them in all typewritten. But they're believing in what we're doing. They realize they've got to be organized. And in Herkimer County, New York today, um, I've signed 65 new members, just going out a few afternoons the last couple months, and we now have 40% of the farmers ship, well, not all shipping, but 40% of the dairy farmers in Herkimer County belong to the National Farmers Organization. <laughs> and we hope when we get this cheese plant going by spring, 40% are going to be shipping every pound of their production with us. And there's no other way. You know that we've got to be organized. Maybe we don't need it at our age, but our kids sure need it. And there's no organization in this world that's going to get them a cost of, cost of production plus a reasonable profit but the National Farmers Organization. I'd like for you to hear Kenton Bailey from Maine. Thank you, Steve. I'm not going to talk very long. It used to take me six hours to give a two-hour presentation. I've become a professional, so I work one-on-one -on -one most of the time, and I get my work done in a good deal less time than that. But you've heard what these folks have had to say to you today, and I want to emphasize and try to pick on a point that I think a lot of us as members of the National Farmers Organization are missing. I've had people come up to me and speak to me at this convention about many different things, but I hope you don't look at the necktie I'm wearing or the sports jacket or the manner in which I'm dressed and think of me any different than a fellow farmer because that's what I was born, where I was born was on a farm. I still live there. I've never been anything but a farmer, but I'm like every single other person. I'm a human being first. So I try to attack the problem by looking at all the people that I meet up and down those country roads as human beings. And it's paid off very good dividends, I hope, for the National Farmers Organization. I boast about it to myself. Only time will tell whether it's that way or not. But I'll tell you some basic principles that we have to follow if we're going to get this job done. I was asked by Walt a year ago, April, to go to work for the meat department. Well, I really was working for the meat department because when I go up and down country roads talking to people, I enroll them as a member of the National Farmers Organization and everything they produce, if we've got a program going, I automatically tell them that they're not doing anything until they're part of it. But I want to prove to you that price won't buy membership. 
unless you and I, the people that are going to get the greatest amount out of it, go and tell the world about it. Show it in a manner, and I look around this room and I see there must be some people that are proud of it because they got these things on and I wear them all the time when I represent NFO. Sometimes people think of us like this and sometimes they look at us like that, being a little backwards, but nevertheless I wear one of them because I want them to know who it is that's coming to talk to them. The attitude has changed so much. I can remember when we used to take those signs off the vehicles because you wanted to get in the dooryard and maybe in the house to talk with somebody before they found out who you were. But you see, if we have people like Walt Hackney and Steve Bohr and many others working for us, and if we don't take advantage of it, we might just well go back and have something else to attract attention, like shoot some calves and put them in a hole or some hogs or have a milk dump or do something else because you're going to have to attract attention. And if we don't care enough to go out and talk to other people about what we're doing, I doubt if you're ever going to attract them because I want to give you some examples. We got involved with the same program that Anita has back in the summer of 1977. We'd gone through the whole bit. We joined during the milk holding action in 67. We got to ship in meat before 68 got out of spring. We went through everything. We didn't always have a plant rep. Everything would go good for a few possum belly loads, and the next thing you know, everybody would be mad because the plant rep forgot to be there because he had to put in some baled hay so the animals got killed and away he went. So did the members. We don't have that problem today. We used to have the deal where you shipped your animals and you waited three weeks for your check because it didn't come through a custodial account. The packer sent the check. We don't have that today. We ship the animals and five days later the members get the check in the mail from a bonded, insured, custodial account. You can't beat that with a club. We have people up our way that still want to go the old way and they wait sometimes two months for that check from their local buyer. Now that isn't the way the law is supposed to work, but it shows you what you do when you go on the outside. We've learned a lot from the National Farmers Organization, and to tell you, if you understand, now I as a dairy farmer I never understood except when that cow couldn't milk any longer, she had to go for beef. I didn't know the difference between canners and cutters and boners and breakers, but I can tell you if there's anybody's marketing a cow today, there's one tremendous amount of difference. And the people that aren't NFO members up our way sometimes see as much difference as 20 cents a pound and 20 bucks a hundred less between the cannon cutter price and the breaker price. Now we have a few people up our way, it's kind of, you know, you can really, if you keep your eyes open and you look around, you can really see what's happening. We don't have many beef producers in Maine that are full-fledged, 100% farmers. You couldn't call them ranchers anyway, because usually they're a retired airplane pilot. <laughs> A banker that's been pensioned off. A school teacher that made a lot of money through the consolidated school district. It rather strikes you rather funny. And they didn't start farming before they retired. The nest egg is used. But something funny is happening though. You can talk to those people about joining and shipping. Because you see, they don't like to lose money. When you've got money, you don't like to lose it. Maybe after you've lost it a, lot, a long time, you know, you don't feel it quite so bad. <laughs> but the point is that I'm trying to make is you might think, because we keep trying this, every once in a while it'll go on in our members. I'll give you an example. Last May, we got up to shipping our cattle through an NFO sale in New York, and that's about 800 miles. We pick up cattle that come to a collection point, and then they put on a, a possum belly, and they go 800 miles to market. The closest ones go over 400. They were getting as high as $1.18 and $1.19. In other words, we get a higher price if they dress over 600. The local market was running about 90 cents a pound on big, thin Holstein canners and cutters. That's something to dress 600 pounds and up. Now that's quite an advantage, isn't it, through NFO? And people, instead of joining and getting more production, they're saying, hey gosh, this is the goods, you don't have to do it. And you don't have to go to those meetings, you don't have to listen to anything. You know, you can go on the outside. You know what happened to the meat market? You saw what Steve put up there. By July 4th, when the talk in the USDA was, we got to bring in more box beef from Argentina. Sometimes the market would drop 12 cents, the yellow sheet would drop 12 cents in a week's time. You know what that did to the cattle industry in this country. But you know something? 
The one thing I think that most of our members forget is, if we're going to win this war, and it's obvious that we aren't winning it with the amount of members in production we've got, we only have two choices, right? That's either go get more of those that are already members and get them to participate. That's one alternative, right? The other alternative is to go get some more members and get them to participate. There's no other thing you can do. You can hire 10 Walt Hackneys and 25 more Steve Boers, and if we don't go get more members or get more of our members to participate, what's the object? We haven't got a thing, have we? Now, let me tell you something, and I'm not going to do any different than the principles that I've practiced since my mother taught them to me. And the one person that was born upon this earth that was perfect left a covenant with his organization when he left. And he says, remember, go, love, teach, and do, meaning you do it first. Then he said, but remember, there's one other covenant, that is to forgive thine enemies. Too many times, as Anita mentioned, somebody in this organization, including me, we got a little bit ticked off at somebody we talked to a long time ago, and we can't seem to come to the conclusion we're all selling our farm production in this country through the wrong type of system, not meaning NFO, but the fact that it doesn't, any of them, get us enough money. Now, I'm not mm -hmm. criticizing NFO because I'm sure that if enough people support it, it would. But now, if I don't go out and boast about it, brag about it, or at least prove that it's doing a better job, do you think those people are going to come running to us? Can you imagine any insurance company, even if they're going to give you a piece of the rock? I don't need any more rock, either. <laughs> do you think they'd ever sell any if somebody didn't go out and boast about it? Now, to prove things like this, you look at Merrill Lynch, Fenner, Pierce, and Smith. All they ever show on TV is a lot of bull. But they keep it out there, and they boast about it, and they get people to come to them. Now, I'll give you an example. In the last two and a half weeks leading up to Saturday, before I came to this convention, we went out one-on-one -on -one up and down the roads in Maine, and we enrolled 22 new members. That's one-on-one. -on -one. It's nothing to brag about. It's just a fact. That's all. But you know what they keep telling us? They'll say this. I take a witness with me. They'll say, you guys are winning. You don't even realize it. You don't realize how much good you're doing for us. You probably think all of us are a bunch of hotheads, and you don't realize we have a hard time saying, you're right, you're winning, we ought to be with you. I should have joined five years ago. You see, the $40 billion that has been borrowed, or more than $40 billion that have been borrowed by the farmers and ranchers in this country the last two years, they didn't borrow it to put a new swimming pool, or buy their sixth Cadillac car, or take a trip to Miami, or maybe some of them did, but not many of them did. And I didn't borrow all that $40 billion either, so I'm not a failure. There's a lot of other people that are in the same position I'm in. But we're never going to get out of it until we're willing to go do that. Now, just a couple other points I wanted to bring up. You see, when we go down the road, you know, it's really easy today. All you ever used to have to promote was that three-year membership agreement, and that was used against us something awful. I'm not going to sign up forever. We find out and we sell this something. It's one of our prime tools we use. Look, all we're asking you to do is come on with us for a year and let's get the job done. We feel that if you'd give it a try for a year and see what we have got, what we have built today, we find out, we keep records on it, over 90% of them we can get to join for one year. When their time expires at the end of that year, they will rejoin of their own free will. Isn't that something? Doesn't take many salesmen to sell that, does it? But you know something? If we don't go do it, it won't get done. I'll give you one other example. If you don't think it's a psychological war, what would you say when the buy? We have one county in Maine. Now we're not very big. We're about 90% as big in land mass as New York State is. They're third in the nation in milk production. Now, if they've got that much milk production, they've got a tremendous amount of culled dairy cows baby calves, you know, a few days to a week or so old, some steers and some other things, as well as some beef herds, because they raise quite a little bit of grain there. We don't have that up our way. But we do have meat. We're a meat deficiency producing area, 
but our price is consistently 10 cents under the yellow sheet. No matter what the yellow sheet is. You want me to tell you something? And you think about it. One county up there has two commission sales and 14 cattle buyers that buy usually a new truck every other year, and they're out selling us. Their meat goes back to two slaughterhouses that we consistently beat anywhere from 10 cents a pound to 23 cents a pound. Now, why aren't those farmers enrolling? All you have to do is look at the county. That's all you have to do. The organization in that county, they never hold a county meeting unless we really get after them. The, man, the, the, man, the head, the chairman of the meat committee, runs his own little store, and if we try to move a load of meat, he gets all the cattle together and runs them through his little slaughterhouse. Now, I know what he's thinking. You say, why haven't you changed it? We are. But see, we can outsell them if we'll only go do it. That's all I got to say. Thank you.